Alberta's new NDP government has tabled its first budget that includes higher spending and taxes and record debt as the province struggles with collapsing resource sector revenue and job losses. The province expects a record deficit of $6.1 billion this year. Next year, it forecasts a deficit of $5.4 billion. It doesn't see returning to surplus until 2019. Just 15 years ago, Alberta was debt-free, but next year, it will have to borrow to finance its operations for the first time in 20 years. The province plans to take more than $3 billion out of its contingency fund, which now stands at $6.5 billion, and it expects that fund to be empty by early 2017. Higher taxes on things like cigarettes and alcohol and other revenue changes are expected to bring in an additional $1.5 billion this year and $2.3 billion in each of the following two years. Alberta's economy has been battered by low oil prices, which have cost the province $6 billion in lost revenue this year alone. To encourage job creation, the province will kick, up to, kick in up to $5,000 for each new job employers create. And it plans to spend $34 billion over the next five years to build new hospitals, schools and roads. So is this the right plan for the province? Time for the big picture. Bill Robson is president and CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. And Armin Yalzan is senior economist at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Armin, best and worst of this budget from your perspective? Well, I think they did the right thing in that they didn't try to do stimulus. It that stimulus would have looked like a whole lot more money. What they said is they needed to do a shock absorber on the, on the uh, deal. And I think, you know, uh, I, I can't actually see the worst. I think they did exactly mm. the right thing given the situation. They have a $6 billion deficit and it's all oil revenues. They got to do something to come back to stable. And what the point they made is why make it worse? Don't make it worse. Well, well, are they making it worse? Deficit, no surprise, Bill. But what about the size of the deficit they predict? Well, you didn't ask me about the best and the worst. Okay. I do want to pay right. one compliment, and it's a total green Was it the eye boots? shade. Was it the geek? boots he put uh, on the table? <laughs> no, it's that Alberta, uh, for a couple of years, went way off the rails when it came to how they presented the numbers. And, all, and just in the lead, we heard a bit about contingency funds and so on. I want to pay them one key compliment, which is they're, they're telling a story that I think is, is pretty grim in many mm -hmm. ways. They're telling it cleanly. Hmm. It's not a small thing. Some governments right. uh, cook their books in various ways, give you multiple bottom lines. Alberta has stayed with a clean presentation, and I'm sure the temptation to go back to the messier one was uh, right. was strong. So I want to pay them that compliment. What you see in the budget and in their financial reports is, is pretty much what you get. Now, what you see is uh, disturbing in many ways. I'm not going to differ from Armin very much in, in terms of her initial assessment. I mean, what else were they going to do this time? Uh, this is, you know, what the mandate said. Uh, I don't think it's going to be durable. I think there will be radical changes of direction in upcoming budgets uh, for some reasons that uh, I'm sure we'll get into. But the taxes aren't going to bring in the revenue they're yeah. expecting. It's based on oil prices that if we're if they're lucky, that happens. But it's it's way above where the market is now. Uh, and, and I think that the popular reaction to it over time, I'm not a political strategist, but it does seem to favor people who work for government at the expense of people who don't. Mm -hmm. And I think over time that also is going to require some recalibration. So not that surprising, but it's going to require a very different budget next On time. assumptions, oil prices here seem to be, they're predicating it on a $62 a barrel oil price, 2017 to 18. Futures now say it's like 55. Isn't that a bit optimistic? Well, futures, who knows? whether futures are right. Nobody's yeah. been able to predict the future well, they well cannot, for a cannot. while now. But the, the truth is that even for this year, just to piggyback on what Bill was saying, even for this year, the 15-16 uh, fiscal year is predicated on $50 oil. Well, they had 50, above $50. They had about $60 averaging from about uh, April the 1st to August. And for the rest of the year, it's been below 50. Mm. I don't know if they'll even meet their 2015-16 target right. uh, for the price of oil. So I think uh, Bill's right that that they may have some unpleasant recalibrations to make down the uh, uh, down the road on the because of the price of oil. You worry about assumptions. It isn't just oil prices. It's uh, overall revenues. Well, it's, it, there are a bunch of things uh, on oil prices. There's a bit of a hedge uh, because the Canadian dollar tends to move with oil prices, and so mm -hmm. it's the price of oil in Canadian dollars that really matters. And so some of the the bleakness of that U.S. dollar forecast would be a bit offset because presumably the Canadian dollar is lower. But I do want to go back to the uh, revenue assumptions. Yeah. It's 
um, always difficult. Like, Alberta depends on very volatile revenue sources, yeah. and they're also relatively distorting taxes, which might be a concern mainly for economists, except that when you raise corporate income taxes and when you raise taxes on high-income uh, uh, individuals, you don't get the revenue you're expecting. Right. And they're going to have to deal with that going forward, especially because the feds are about to jam it up to uh, uh, high-income earners as well. So all of the governments that are counting on revenue from that source as we go forward into next year and so on, they're going to be looking around and there are going to be shortfalls and they're going to have to somehow make that up. So maybe a sales tax isn't that far off. I, I actually don't future. think that the biggest problem is the revenue side and what they're doing with taxes because they're going from flat taxes to very modest increases in prog pro progressivity this year and next. The bigger issue, the day of the budget, Shell pulled out $2 billion worth of capital expenditures right. in the oil sands. So it's that kind of more shocks to come. It's and not huge a front ripple in terms of shock. the labor market and all those Absolutely. business taxes, yeah. all that now, stuff. Now, that said, the Alberta economy is more diversified than many in the country. People seem to think that it, you know, it, it gets huge booms and busts because of oil. But the sectors, like there's a lot of employment across the sectors, mm. and I disagree with Bill that they're going to have to relook at why they're adding on to public sector jobs because they've already said why they're going to do that. That you know, Services are needed and this is one way of stabilizing the economy. Perhaps it's not stimulus but they are investing in infrastructure. Right. In, in a province that has a lot of skilled people who can build roads if they're not going to be up north building an oil sands facility. Is this a good move for them, Bill? And I mean, I'm sure this is informed by your worldview of whether or not <laughs> infrastructure spending makes any sense at all. Well, infrastructure spending is a good thing to spend on compared to you know a lot of transfer payments and other things that might get consumed right away. So so that much of it is good. Uh, also, even if you don't believe in stimulus, uh, there is no better time to spend on infrastructure than when the yellow metal is otherwise going to be just sitting there doing nothing. So all, all good so far. But the thing that is worth uh, underlining here is um, I like the way they do their numbers, but it, it w but it means that the bottom line you see on the budget and the amount they actually need to borrow can diverge very markedly because infrastructure spending gets amortized over time. So it gets brought into expense very slowly. But of course, when you're doing the infrastructure spending, you have to borrow a ton up front. When you look at the deficit over the next few years, not that alarming a figure. When you look at the amount of borrowing they're planning to do, a much, much larger number. And that does worry me because the feds look like they're going to be borrowing. Ontario is still borrowing. A lot of governments around the world well, are doing a lot of borrowing. Well, perhaps you should be a lender. Then you'd be in, having a great day. <laughs> I would rather have a slightly higher interest rate. I want to ask you about this job creation plan. $5,000 to employers. Uh, Jack Mintz isn't a fan. Chamber of Commerce isn't a fan. Says it won't create new jobs. What do you think? It seems like small potatoes. It seems like it'd be an expensive program to administer. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of these type of cuts. 27,000 jobs is less than what they created in the private sector in October of 2004. 14, which was mm. 41,000 jobs. So, you it's know, like a hobby. Uh, yeah, it, uh, but I think it's the right signal. If you're going to give tax cuts to corporations, do it because they're doing something you want. With respect to the borrowing limit, 15% of GDP. They're putting the tightest ceiling on borrowing of any government ever, and that makes sense because even this last year, 2014-15, they had a surplus. They're going back into surplus. That's what they're aiming for, just over a longer time frame than you'd like. I'm making the point that that bottom line that you just mentioned isn't the one that matters for the total amount of debt that they issue. They're issuing way more debt than what the deficit shows because it's financing infrastructure. So far, so good. But you still have to finance it all, $45 billion over the next few years. It's a lot of money in a world that might be getting a bit of indigestion about government debt. David Dodge says this is the best time in the world. And David own. Dodge is a smart guy, but I wouldn't agree with him on that. <laughs> okay, okay, we're done. See if we can get him here. We're going to stay where you stay where you are. We're going to be right back with you. Coming up, Bombardier may be about to soar thanks to some hefty financial backing that may be coming from the Quebec government. The big picture continues after this. Bombardier is expected to announce disappointing financial earnings tomorrow, but there's word the Quebec government may be about to hand it a financial lifeline. Bombardier has been struggling with its new C-Series jet program. The company says the medium-range planes cut fuel use, noise, and emissions, and savings for buyers could be as high as $12 million per plane. But the program is over budget and more than three years behind schedule. Now, some media outlets are reporting Bombardier will write down billions of dollars they put into the project so far in exchange for Quebec government support for further development costs which could run another billion. The company won't comment on those rumors. The big picture continues with Bill and Armin, and I want to ask you, Armin, if this was your money, 
really your money, not just as a taxpayer, if you lived in Quebec, would this be a place you would bet it? Such a tough question. Yeah. Because I'm not just me. In the case of the Quebec government, they're trying to support the whole economy. Yeah, and tens and of thousands of jobs well, in aerospace. 40,000 jobs go with Bombardier if Bombardier goes. It's like the big three in Ontario in 2008 and 2009. So there's an argument to put money in there, but I just want to bring this back to debt issues because Quebec's got the biggest debt to GDP ratio in the country and the most aggressive plan to pay down debt. In fact, the billion dollars we're talking about is the money that was earmarked to, to be paid down on their debt reduction plan for this year. So the question is, will they get more aggressive on some other ground to mm. be able to save some of those jobs to be able to meet their debt reduction target. I think, you know, it's it's a fascinating story and one that waits to be told, but I don't think they can step away from this. That one. was a long way of not answering my specific question. Bill, if this was your money, would you bet it? Uh, I do. I own shares in Bombardier. Uh, I don't know if I should declare that, um, but I will say that the fact that you can't raise the money from the private sector and then the government's willing to kick it in lets me make a, a, a more important point, which is that people often talk about government money as though the borrowing costs are low, therefore it's low cost to society. It's only low cost to society if you ignore the fact that the individuals whose money it is, if offered the choice, might prefer to do something else. Mm. And and when you look at an investment of this kind, nobody ever makes that calculation. They always say, well, it costs the Quebec government so much to borrow. So the costs of doing this type of thing are understated. And, and that that's a that's a general point on this particular one what would i really like to see i'd really like to see uh jets at the island airport <laughs> porter buy some of these things because it, it from all accounts they're good airplanes right uh, and that gives Bombardier what it so badly needs, which is an actual order to get this thing off the ground. They're in a tough market niche. So I, did I dodge your question effectively? A little bit, but I'll give it to you. I'm going to ask a supplementary here. Uh, aerospace is not the same as a coffee chain. Embraer in Brazil, there's a lot of government engagement in, these, uh, in the competitors in other jurisdictions. How does that factor into the decision that the Quebec government will need to make? Well, once it, it sort of explains how you got into it in the first place, because you could make a very strong argument earlier in the days of aerospace that this was a, an infant industry, that the R&D and the technological developments had all kinds of spin-offs that would be beneficial to the rest of society. And when there were only a few of those types of things going, that was a, quite a persuasive argument. Now, as you point out, there's a lot more of it, and many governments are prepared to sink, we don't know how much money into it. So if you're bidding against whoever's the kind of craziest with their own public money, you're in a bit of a game you can't win. Um, uh, now, Quebec's a long way in already. Uh, it's very tough to recommend pulling the plug on this, but we have a lot of examples of governments that have made this type of commitment in the past, and I hope that they're uh, cognizant of the lessons about how much you expose yourself, what the conditions are, because they're, every, you know, like we say, every project has two stages, too early to tell and too late to kill. <laughs> this isn't new territory. We can be smarter than that. Uh, it, yes, Armin. Okay, so I think that this isn't about aerospace. It's about the C-Series. Um, and the C-Series was designed to be the most fuel-efficient jet at a time of $100 a barrel oil. It's still poised to do that. Airbus, Boeing, those are fleets, uh, uh, jets in fleets that are going to be retired and mothballed. There's a real chance for C-Series to pick up. What we're dealing with is sloth. China's stuttering. China's going to buy the railway division. It did not because it's doing poorly right now. And also an area where fuel prices matter less to airlines from their P&L perspective because exactly. it's just not as expensive as it was. But here's a, here's a cute little piece of information. Is there a cat or a puppy dog in it? Yeah, no, I don't have Not any quite. cats or puppy oh, dogs. No, right. I, what I've got is slow TTC <laughs> okay, lines. Okay, all right. Right? Big delays. Delays in the C-Series, delays in the TTC cars. So what Quebec may giveth uh, with one hand, Toronto may taketh away with a suit on the other hand because we're waiting for our subway cars. Right. Well, literally, literally and figuratively. Actually, since we were uh, complaining or, or warning about low oil prices earlier, we should say that even for a fuel-efficient plane, fuel's a huge deal. The airlines have more money. People will fly more so the low fuel prices that are a problem for Alberta are, are good for uh, Bombardier, but they have to make those initial sales. Well, this is going to be an interesting well, one. Well, they've got 243 out of 300 sales that they need to go commercial, so we're almost there. We're almost there. You we, could buy a couple, and we'd be, all, we'd be all the way there if you put it on your own line of credit. That is true. Armin and Bill, thank you very much. We Pleasure. will see you again.